ancient India, drama was written only in Sanskrit. The earlier Sanskrit play was written sometime in the 3rd century BC and the great tradition of Sanskrit drama died out in the 8th century AD. After that, there is no drama in India, total silence. This may seem surprising, but the reason for this is that Sanskrit declined in importance after the 8th century and the regional languages came up. Tamil, Telugu, Kannada in South India and in the north, the Prakrit languages, which later became Gujarati, Marathi, Hindi or what have you. And in these languages, there was no drama. They didn't like written text. They treated performances, all kinds of performances as similar. A drama was like music or dance. That is, it was not recorded. It was only handed down. It was given from the guru to the disciple. And this meant that these forms kept on changing their shapes through the centuries. The arts of the rural folk have been journeying through centuries, carrying with them the rhythm of the ages and the imprints of the social environments in which they took their shapes and structures. In the state of Karnataka, home to Dravidian languages Kannada and Tulu, folk and traditional theatre forms have survived conquest and colonization, standing up to the great challenges of time and commerce. Yakshagana, a thriving traditional theatre form of coastal Karnataka, is an iconic example of a surviving narrative that has retained originality in form and yet adapted itself to the urgency of its times. Yakshagana constitutes the great bridge between the ancient and classical Natya Shastra and the little traditions of local inspiration. The men play the female roles as is the case with most traditional theatre forms. The vitality that Yakshagana has acquired in terms of popularity, patronage and improvised content owes much to the major reinventions that were attempted in the middle of the 20th century when performances were done for the first time in the local Tulu language too. For its range of colour, costume and movement, the Yakshagana is an artist's dream. What makes Yakshagana unique is the artistic license it gives us as choreographers. I aim at capturing its rustic vibrancies to blend it in my choreographies to meet the present social haste and the language barriers. This actually helps me to preserve and reach out to the different cross sections of audiences in India and abroad. In India and abroad. Yakshagana has its artistic cousins in Kuchipudi and Bhagavata Mela of the neighboring Andhra Pradesh, Tirukutu of Tamil Nadu, Kathakali of Kerala and the Dasavatari of Kunkun, but remains distinct as a form. The music represents the old school of South Indian music, with about 50 ragas changing according to the situation. It has a strong folk element in it and is rich in its range and adaptability. The dance is full of energy and raw power. With its highly stylized and elaborate makeup and costumes, Yakshagana exhibits a high degree of aesthetics. Yakshagana, usually performed in open fields, generally begins late in the evening and lasts until daybreak. The performers improvise movement and interpretation, tirelessly keeping rhythm and tempo. Most of these forms go back to about four centuries in their present form, about 400 years, not more than that. With the sole exception, of course, of Kudiyattam, which is at least 1,200 years old. We have texts there in the Kudiyattam repertoire which go, go back to the 8th century. Scholars believe that Kuriyatam of Kerala is the only surviving form that represents the staging of the ancient Sanskrit drama according to the principles of Bharata's treatise, the Natya Shastra. 
The elaborate makeup, again done by the performers themselves, lasts as long as four hours. In spite of its antiquity, or given the counter argument that it is precisely because of it, the Chakyar cast members who traditionally play the characters in the drama allow women to play active roles in the performances. The inherent spiritual nature of this art form compels the artists to lose themselves in a meditative trance as they prepare to perform. The enthralling ritualism of Kuriyatam and the aesthetics of the form give it a unique place in the heritage of Kerala, the home of the Malayalam language. There is a romance in the very story of the revival of this great art form that has struggled through decades of neglect and want of patronage. One day, I happened to see the great thespian, the living legend, <coughs> Guru Amanur Madhavachakyar, at the Trichur temple, Kuttambalam, where he was performing. There began G. Venu's journey of devotion and respect for the Guru and this most pristine art. In some temples of Kerala, theatres have been specially constructed for Kuriyatam performances. Kerala is also a treasure house of classical traditions in Kathakali, Mohiniyatam and Krishnanatam. Now after 25 years, we have now very efficiently trained, very outstanding, talented young performers trained by Guru Amanur Mathurjaya. Kalidasa's Abhigyana Sakuntalam has been universally acclaimed as the most resplendent drama ever created. The finely nuanced movements of the eyes, Netra Abhinaya and the hands, Astamudras, are enthralling to the appreciative Rasikas among the Sahidriyas or members of the audience. Holding center stage for hours at a time, women go beyond stereotypes, setting Kuriyatam apart from other traditional folk theatre forms. When there is a popular classical drama, we can see all over India and other part of Asia also, even in Europe, we can find a small puppet version of it. Pava Kathakali is the traditional glove puppet play of Kerala, practiced particularly in and around Palgat district. Pava meaning puppet, and Kathakali, meaning story play, developed into its present form in the 18th century. The characters of Mahabharata, Ramayana, if it once it is introduced, even once in a lifetime, if it is introduced to children, it can be a lifelong experience. The range of puppets, one to two foot high, are carved on wood and joined together with thick cloth cut and stitched into a small bag. The puppeteers insert their hands into the bag to manipulate the puppets. The few families of puppeteers who speak a mix of Telugu and Malayalam appear to have migrated from the state of Andhra Pradesh. They excel in adapting the dance stories of Kathakali. The episodes are usually drawn from the Mahabharata. The songs are traditionally in Sanskrit and are rendered by the puppeteers themselves. The conventions of Kathakali character types are followed in the costumes, headgear, jewelry and makeup of the puppets. The 
puppeteers, linked in emotion to the puppets, provide the eloquent and dramatic expressions to these puppets by what seems a magical transference. The performers are vital links in an unbroken tradition. What accounts for this extraordinary continuity of Indian traditional forms? There are several reasons, but the most important is a movement called Bhakti, which means devotion or faith. This movement began sometime in the 6th century in Tamil Nadu and then spread like wildfire all over India. The movement rejected all ritualism, it rejected hierarchy in society, it rejected priesthood, it said God was approachable to every person. Any person only had to surrender himself to God and God would be available. And he could do this surrendering not through fire sacrifices and rituals like that, but by singing and dancing. If you sang God's name, if you danced his name, then God would become available to you. And he was as accessible to the lower caste man as he was to an upper caste man. The Bhakti tradition quite categorically rejected the abstruse gods, Vedic gods, you know, like Indra and Varuna, who lived up there in the skies and demanded that gods be personalized, they be available to them. And so they went to Rama and Krishna and to the epics. So all the stories came from the Mahabharata or the Ramayana or the Bhagavata. Real stories which treat God as though he were a part of everyday life. The amazing tradition of Terukutu in Tamil Nadu is that these everyday characters playing the gods of the Hindu pantheon are permitted every now and then to become themselves during the performances. Terukutu transcends the limitations of the unities of time and space, even of period and character, to sustain itself as a living tradition. The big screen heroes of Tamil cinema, the clamor of the Tamil television channels, cannot drown out the call of Terukutu performers, their voices carrying over a radius of one kilometer from the stage holding the audience in their thrall. The community watches the performers, people like themselves, transposed and transporting in an old and engaging game. The working village community that sustains Tirukuta cannot accommodate elaborate hours to make up. Homemade dyes are quickly applied. Doctors are done in about half an hour. It is the performance that lasts six to eight hours, with the characters joining the singing choir when their bits of the act are done. The familiarity of the epic stories allow for witty, contextual interpretations that are appreciated by the knowing audience. In these seasonal theatre forms, the stories of the old blend with the stories of now in a world of flowing narratives. <laughs> Time is yet to be divided by colonial, cultural and commercial interventions into ancient, medieval and modern periods. Then is now. The past is present here and they are us. The stories of the gods are stories of the people. ஆதி காலத்தில் இதுக்கு முதலீடு கிடையாது கட்டக்கூத்துக்கு அதனால் ஒரு பிடிமானமோ ஒரு ஒழுங்கு முறையோ இல்லாத இருந்தது அப்போ இந்த கட்டக்கூத்து மாதிரி குறைஞ்சி போச்சு இதுக்கும் முதலீடு வச்சு இதுக்கும் முதலீடு வைக்கணும் முதலீடு வச்சு இப்போ நடத்துறதுனால ஒரு குழு ஒரு அக்ரிமெண்ட் மாதிரி இந்த புரட்டாசி மாதம் ஒன்று சேர்ந்தாங்கன்னா அடுத்த புரட்டாசி மாதம் வரைக்கும் இந்த கம்பெனி விட்டு போகக்கூடாது 
with the act done in one village, the troop moves on to the next, as long as the season lasts. When the paint is wiped off with coconut oil, the performers return to agriculture for their livelihood. As one Terukutu guru put it, we don't worry much about money. Now what made these traditions financially possible was that the financial risk was taken by either the king or the minister or the landlord or the local officer or even by some person who had made a vow to the temple. For instance, if I wanted a child, I could go to the temple and make a vow that if I had a child, I would sponsor a, a performance. This meant that the financial risk of all these performances was taken by a few organizations and the common audience did not have to spend money. They came, they sat there, they enjoyed the show. More than anything else, they were willing to take the aesthetic risk of things going wrong. This allowed for improvisation, which is the essential basic quality of Indian performing arts. And the enormous success of the traditional Indian art forms is attributable to the fact that no money comes into the picture so that they could grow and let down roots among the common people. Togalu Bomalata is another wonderful example of the great traditions of shadow puppetry in Asia. Togalu means leather in Telugu, a language of the state of Andhra Pradesh, and Bomalu means dolls. The form is said to have originated in 200 BC, but it was in the 16th century that a version of the Ramayana was specially composed for a Togalu Bomalu performance. The manuscript Ramayana Rangakatana included instructions for the construction and decoration of the shadow puppets. <laughs> Typically, a troupe of six to ten artists comprising of manipulators, singers, dancers and instrumentalists stage the vibrant shows. The traditional artists come from homes where children learn to handle puppets before they learn the alphabet. These are artists who have travelled to Germany and New York but struggle back home in their rural existence. In our country, there is no one who has been there. There is no one who has been there. There is no one who has been the shadow of the commercial world looms large over the little puppets, but the artists battle on for their muse. In the end, it is the art that endures. With the arrival of the British, with the arrival of the British, a new kind of theatre emerged in the Indian cities. This was urban theatre which was based on the Victorian model. There was the proscenium which separated the stage from the audience. There was the emphasis on commercial viability which meant the audience for the first time in the history of India paid to see a show. And along with this, there was a contempt for traditional Indian theatre. It was seen as passe, as something degenerate that should be allowed to die probably. But fortunately, in 1930s, some people came forward to work for Indian theatre to try and save as many forms as possible. The most famous example, of course, is the one in 1931 when the Madras Music Academy decided to adopt Sadr, a dance form which was looked upon with contempt as the dance form of the Devadasis, of the uh, Notch Girls. The Madras Music Academy adopted it and called it Bharatanatyam and since then you know what's happened to Bharatanatyam. Similarly, Vallathol did it with Kathakali, Shivram Karanth, much later did it with the Yakshagana and so on. I am glad to say that I have also had a share, a small share in this excitement. 
In 1988, when I became the chairman of the Sangeet Natak Academy, I was approached by Appu Kuttanayar, a great scholar from Kerala, who said that unless something was done, Kuriyattam would become extinct. The last Chakya, the last guru was more than 80 years old and there were no students and no money and no future for the art form. And the academy rushed to the defense of the art form. We funded schools and I'm delighted now when I see that Kuriyattam is recognized as one of the great art forms of the world and the UNESCO has actually included it in world heritage. Although much has been done in this direction since independence, I do believe that the effort must continue. Through the centuries, the uh, traditional forms have survived because of their energy of their own, because of their vitality. But today there is so much competition and the countryside is changing so radically that unless some positive effort is made to save these forms, I fear they will disappear, taking with them all their riches into oblivion.